Hello and welcome to this YouTube video for um, CAP plan about the conceptual framework for financial reporting. My name is Belinda Wargent and I'm a tutor here at CAP plan. Um, this little tutorial is relevant to anyone who's taking the financial accounting and reporting papers in ACCA and SEMA. Uh, my plan is to chat through some elements of the conceptual framework and the main contents of it. And as we go through, I'll just give the odd example from financial reporting. Um, depending on what level in your studies you are, some of those examples you won't recognise because you may not have covered them yet in your studies. That's absolutely fine. I'm just trying to give a, a range. So it kind of, you know, it's something for everybody. And let's get started. So first of all, why do we need a conceptual framework for financial reporting? Well, if we just dove in and started preparing financial statements, there'd be a few fundamental questions that you might want to ask about them that really aren't answered in the accounting standards, such as what is an asset? So what do we mean by an asset? And if you want to have a financial reporting standard that puts an asset in your financial statements, what do we mean by that? Such as we're preparing these financial statements, who are we preparing them for? And what is it that they're intending to do with those financial statements? Such as OK, I've got an expense, but where should I put that expense? Should I put that expense in profit or loss? Should I put that expense in other comprehensive income? It's not clear. The framework tries to answer these questions and a lot more questions as well. And just to set out the basics, the underlying fundamental principles of financial reporting. What is it then? It's issued by the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB. They issued it many, many years ago and they update it periodically. And the last update um, as of the time of this recording was 2018. So that's the version of the framework we should all be watching and listen, listening to and, and using when we're preparing accounts. The third bullet here is important. The framework is not an accounting standard. So to the extent that an accounting standard is different to the rules and the ideas in the framework, the accounting standard takes precedence. So the framework is not the rules, it's the underlying principles of financial reporting. And as I've said here, it underpins financial reporting by setting out the underlying concepts of financial reporting and the definitions of some of those basic things like assets and liabilities. So why is it useful? Um, three little bubbles down the bottom here. Um, it helps accountants how to decide to account for things. So we live in an ever-changing world. Things are changing. A few years ago, cryptocurrency wasn't a thing. It didn't exist. So suddenly, when companies are having cryptocurrency and having to account for them, what is cryptocurrency? How does that fit into your accounts? There isn't an accounting standard for cryptocurrency. So go back to the framework. Try and decide from that. People, the International Accounting Standards Board, are constantly developing new accounting standards and amending the old ones, and they need a basic set of underlying rules and principles to embed into those accounting standards. So again, the framework helps them with that. And also, it makes sure the focus is in the right place. When you're stuck in, you're preparing accounts, you're preparing financial statements, it's easy to forget the fact that actually you're preparing them in order to help somebody else who's reading those financial statements. So that's another thing. It just makes sure the focus stays on the people who are important in this whole process. Now, we... As far as we're concerned, there are seven different parts of the framework. There's actually an eighth, but it doesn't feature very highly in any of the ACCA or SEMA syllabuses. So I'm not going to talk about capital maintenance in this tutorial here, but I will talk about the seven main parts of the framework as listed here. So underlying principles, first of all, the purpose of financial reporting. So why are we doing it? Why are we preparing financial statements? Who is using those financial statements and what do they want from them? The qualitative characteristics are about the sorts of characteristics financial information needs in order to make it useful to the people who are using that financial information. The elements are the main parts of financial statements. So the elements are the assets, the liabilities, the equity, income and expenses, all the little parts that when you put them together make a full set of financial statements and we'll see the definitions of those elements. 
Recognition is about when you put something into your financial statements. So to recognize something is to actually do a debit or a credit and to put it into your primary statements. So we'll see what the rules are about when you do that, when you recognize an element. And derecognition is the other end of the chain there where you finished with it, you no longer have that asset, that liability, so you take it out of your financial statements and we'll see when it's appropriate to derecognize to take out something from your financial statements. Measurement is about the number that you attribute to your element, so we'll see a couple of different ways of measuring those things. And finally, presentation and disclosure really for us focuses on where you put those costs and income. So should you be putting them in statement of profit or loss, or should they be going in other comprehensive income? We will talk through each of these seven parts of the framework in order. So we will start with the purpose of financial reporting. Who is reading these financial statements and what sort of information do they want from it? And this is from the framework. So per the framework, the reason we prepare financial statements, the purpose of financial reporting is to provide information to current and potential investors and lenders and other creditors that will enable them to make decisions about providing economic resources to the entity. So I'm seeing two things here. I'm seeing that the main people who are using financial statements, the people who are reading these financial statements are the investors, the people who are investing in the equity in the company, and also the creditors, the people who are owed money by the company. Why do they want this financial information? Because it's going to help them to make informed decisions about investing in the equity of the company or maybe coming out and taking out their money and about lending money to the company. That is the basic purpose of financial statements. Now, you and I know there are lots of other people that use financial statements, employees, the government, management, suppliers, customers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But for our purposes in the framework, we're going to focus on the investors and the creditors. And why do they want that information? How are they going to use that information to make their economic decisions? Well, two things that they're going to use the information to assess. First of all, people look at financial statements, which are historical, aren't they? Historical financial statements are based on something that happened in the past, but users, the investors and the lenders are going to look at those financial statements and make decisions about the future. So they'll try and assess from those financial statements what they think the company is going to do in the future and therefore whether they think going forward it's a good bet or not. The other thing that they're going to do with those financial statements is they're going to assess what we say here in the framework is management's stewardship of the entity's economic resources. What does that mean? That means how well the directors are managing the company's assets. How well are the directors using the company's assets in order to make profits? As an example, and I'll try and shove the odd example in as we go along, for example, have you heard of discontinued operations? So when a company has a whole part of it that either it's stopped doing during the year or maybe it's just about to stop just after the year and it's just about to sell it off, so a whole division, then that's called a discontinued operation. And on the face of the statement of profit or loss, a company excludes the results of that discontinued operation all the way through its profit and loss account, it just shows its continuing operations. And then the discontinued operations are shown absolutely separately on a separate part at the very bottom of the statement of profit or loss. Why? It's so the users can clearly see it's a discontinued operation and they can see, oh, OK, discontinued. That means it's not going to be there materially into the future. That helps the users to assess the entity's future cash flows because those future cash flows aren't going to include that discontinued operation. OK, so that's the purpose of financial reporting. It's for those users, those investors and those lenders, and they're going to use it to try and assess the company's future cash flows, assess how well the directors are doing and in the end make financial decisions based on that information. We're now going to move on to the second one in the list here, the qualitative characteristics. So if those users are looking at this financial information, trying to make their economic decisions, then what sort of characteristics should that financial information have in order to be useful to those users? <laughs> 
there are two sorts of qualitative characteristics. There's the fundamental ones, absolutely fundamental, that the financial information we present to those users is relevant to what they're trying to do and also is a faithful representation of what the company is about. So it's fairly true. There were also some enhancing characteristics that make it even better. Verifiability, timeliness, understandability and comparability. We'll look at each of these two categories of qualitative characteristics in order. So we'll start with the fundamental characteristics of relevance and faithful representation. Right, what does relevance mean? Well, in order to be useful to users, information has to affect their decisions it's got to be relevant to their decision making processes it's got to aid them in assessing the future cash flows and assessing the stewardship of management but also there's another concept that links directly in with relevance and that is materiality which you may have heard of materiality is literally a measure of whether something is important to the people reading the financial statements or not if something is material then it's important. And if it isn't material, it is not. So literally materiality and relevance are, are, are linked in with each other. And an example of an application of materiality is the prior year adjustment rule when you make a mistake. So what if we found out that we made a mistake in a previous financial reporting period? OK, so we know that our accounts from a previous period, maybe from last year, are wrong. What do we do about it? If that error is immaterial, then we don't change last year's financial statements because it's not going to be relevant to the users to see those changed numbers. However, if a prior period error is material, then we do need to change those financial statements. Now, we can't actually change the financial statements that we filed. So what we do is in this year's accounts, we change the comparative figures and we change the brought forward figures to show the right numbers to correct that error so that the users can actually see the proper comparatives in this year's financial statements. And that's only done when it's material. What about faithful, represent uh, faithful representation then? So for something to have a faithful representation, what do we mean? It's kind of honest. So there's kind of four sides to that. It's got to be complete. So everything has to be included. It's not a faithful representation if you've missed out a huge amount of liabilities that the company has. Yeah, that's not true. It's got to be free from error. So if you make a whopping big mistake, then those accounts don't show a faithful representation of the company. Substance over form is where you account for the economic substance of a transaction rather than the legal reality. And an example of that is redeemable preference shares. So when a company issues redeemable preference shares, it gets a load of money, it's going to pay some sort of preference dividend over three years, and then it's going to pay back the capital to the shareholders. We say, well, you might have called it shares on your documentation but in reality the economic substance is this is a loan isn't it you've borrowed the preference share capital off of the investors and then you're going to pay it back in a few years time so actually we account for redeemable preference shares as a liability because that's the economic substance of those redeemable preference shares and those dividends we actually account for them as interest in the statement of profit or loss the final kind of prong of faithful representation is neutrality. So we will be neutral. We won't try and overstate our assets or understate our liabilities. We won't do the opposite. We won't understate assets or overstate our liabilities. So neutrality is the fundamental principle there underlying faithful representation. However, you can see I've written something else under it there, which is if you're not sure in conditions of uncertainty, we apply a bit of prudence. So for example, variable consideration. If I sell something to somebody for a thousand pounds and I say to them, oh, and if I hit certain targets, if I do a really good job, then you'll have to pay me an extra 200 pounds. That extra 200 pounds is what we call variable consideration. We might get it, we might not. And actually, we're only going to recognise variable consideration as part of our revenue if it's very, very likely that we're going to get it. So we don't anticipate that £200 and bring it in as revenue if we're not really very sure about it. And that's an example of just applying a bit of prudence in conditions of uncertainty. <laughs>
those are the fundamental qualitative characteristics onto the other ones the enhancing characteristics and there are four of these um, verifiability is about being based on some sort of substance some sort of truth so it's about the information being credible and reliable you could actually produce some evidence to somebody to say look this is why i've put these figures in the financial statements and they'd say oh yeah i can see that fair enough timeliness is about the trade-off between spending enough time to get all the information you need and putting it into the accounts however getting it out to the users in time for it actually to be useful to them and actually you don't want to give people information too late because however good it is however right it is however relevant and faithfully represented it is it's not going to be useful to them so we need to get information out in good time to our users understandability is one of the misunderstood ones in this list here it doesn't have to be understandable to everybody so my 11 year old daughter doesn't need to understand financial statements and i don't think she does but um, it needs to be understandable to somebody who already has a basic knowledge of financial reporting so information should be clear should be concise shouldn't be be fuddled and muddled up with far too much immaterial disclosure. We don't want to clutter those financial statements, but it needs to be understandable to somebody who has the financial tools to understand financial information. And finally, comparability is about being able to compare the same company over time. So you want to be able to compare this company's results this year with last year's results for the same company but also you want to be able to compare different entities and an example of that is when you do a prior year adjustment for a change in accounting policy so suppose we have always accounted for something in one way and then we change our accounting policy you should actually change your comparatives so that people can see the two years worth of accounts next to each other using the same accounting policy and that's an example of comparability between entities we achieve comparability by laying out rules so there's standard formats there's ways that people have to account for things to make sure that different companies account for things in the same way and therefore investors can compare them okay that was the qualitative characteristics on to the elements there are five basic elements of financial statements. The first three you will see in the statement of financial position and the next two you'll see in the statement of total comprehensive income. Running down the list, what are they? So an asset, you think of an asset as being an asset, don't you? A desk, a building, a car, but actually more things than that are assets. A receivable is an asset, cash is an asset, uh, investments are an asset, cryptocurrency is an asset. What is an asset? An asset is an economic resource controlled by the entity as a result of a past event and there's a little definition of economic resource at the bottom there it's the right that has the potential to produce economic benefits so the reason that your building is your asset is not because it's physically there but because you're going to be using that building to earn money somehow you're going to be using it with your staff in it as your head office as your shop as your warehouse you're going to be maybe selling it and making money out of it that's what makes it an asset um, an example of something that isn't an asset then so what if i pay money to train my staff that money that i've spent surely i'm creating an asset there because now i've got staff who are really well trained no and that's because of the word control here staff training doesn't create an asset because you don't control those staff you can't stop them leaving your company and taking their new know-how to somebody else so you don't capitalize staff training and that's actually one of the is is 38 what's a liability then a liability is a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource because of something that happened in the past it was an obligation so you might have created an obligation because you signed a contract or because there's a law that says you have to do something or you might have an obligation because you've created a situation where people expect you to do something and you can't act in another way so an example of that would be where you create a constructive obligation to make a load of staff redundant you've decided to make redundancies you've announced it to your staff you've created an obligation there you're going to have to make those redundancies pay off those staff the past event was the announcement equity is a residual interest in the net assets of an entity so we see equity don't we where an entity issues equity shares and then the people that own those shares have an interest in the company's net assets 
income is an increase in assets. So I've sold something, I've got a receivable or a decrease in liabilities. Um, I don't know, foreign exchange rates have changed and so my overseas liability, I owe a bit less, something like that. That would give you income. And that all results in an increase in equity, an increase in net assets. Um, Contributions from equity holders is where you issue shares and people invest in those shares. That's not counted as income because the people who invested in those shares, the, the investors in the company, they might see an increase in their net assets, but that's because they paid money out of their bank accounts to achieve that. So we don't count that as income for them. <clears throat> On the expenses side, an expense is when your asset has decreased or your liabilities increased, resulting in a, a decrease in equity, which again is net assets. Again, if you pay out dividends to your shareholders, that's not counted as an expense because although the company's net assets are decreasing, the shareholders get that money into their bank account. So it's not counted as a cost to them. That was the elements, the assets, liabilities, equity, income and expenses. And those definitions are applied in a lot of the different accounting standards. So I think I have an element, I think I have an asset. Can I then put the asset in my statement of financial position? Can I put a debit in my statement of financial position for that asset? That is the recognition criteria, which we'll look at now. This is the recognition criteria from the framework and there's three parts to it. So an item should be recognized, put a double entry for in the financial statements if it meets the definition of an element and if such recognition provides relevant information to help the users assess those future cash flows, assess the stewardship of management and if recognition faithfully represents the entity's financial performance and position. So those are the three prongs of recognising an item in the financial statements. So let's think of something that is an asset that you wouldn't recognize. Internally generated goodwill. I've been running my business for years. Everybody knows my name. Everybody likes me. Lots of people come into my shop. I've built up an inherent value in my name, in my business, in my goodwill in the local community. And that has a value, doesn't it? That is an asset. That is something that's under your control. Other people can't take it away from you. It's something that's going to provide you with future economic resources. It's something that you've built up as a result of a past event. So tick for the first little bullet there. It does meet the definition of an element. Would it be relevant to show it to your users in the financial statements? Arguably, yes. Yes, because people would want to see what's the inherent value in your business. Internally generated goodwill actually fails on the third point here. You don't know how much it's worth. It's very, very hard and far too subjective to place an actual numerical value on that good feeling, that customer happiness, that faithfulness of your customers, the fact they keep coming back to your shop. You can't place a value on it. So we couldn't put a number in the financial statements that faithfully represents the entity's financial performance and position. And that's why you don't recognise internally generated goodwill. And again, that's a rule in an accounting standard in IS 38. There's a flip side to recognition, which is when wouldn't you recognize something? So you wouldn't recognize something if you're not sure if it's real or not of its existence. So that might be the case with certain intangible assets. You wouldn't recognize it if there was a very low probability of it happening. So for example, somebody's suing you, but there's a very low chance that they're gonna win. Um, or if you can't put a reliable number on it. So the internally generated goodwill, you definitely couldn't put a reliable number on that. And if you don't recognise an asset or liability as a debit or credit in your accounts, it might be that you put a disclosure note into the accounts to tell people about it. An example of that is a contingent liability. So by its very definition, a contingent liability is a possible future payout. However, there's too much uncertainty about its timing or its amount, or maybe the obligating event hasn't quite happened yet by the year end. What would you do with a contingent liability? You don't recognise it. You don't do a, a credit in your statement of financial position to put a liability in, but if it's relevant, you would disclose it in a note to the financial statements.
That was the recognition criteria. Next question, when do I take something out of my financial statements? That's de-recognition. So per the framework, we should de-recognize an asset or a liability when basically it's not an asset or a liability to your company anymore. So for an asset, it's not your asset when you don't have control of it anymore. For liability, it's not your liability when you no longer have an obligation for that future transfer of economic resources. Examples, if I sell an asset, I don't have control of that asset anymore. If I sell an asset, then I've passed control of it over to my customer, so I should de-recognise the asset, take the asset out of my statement of financial position. If I, let's say, had a liability that was convertible debt, it's a liability in my statement of financial position, but one day we get to the end of the period and the debt holders say, oh, no, I'm not going to take my money, actually. Instead, issue me with some shares in the company. So we owed some money. We didn't have to pay the money in the end. Instead, we issued some share certificates. That liability has gone. Those debt holders have now become shareholders. So if you convert convertible debt into shares at the end of the period, we remove the liability from the statement of financial position because we don't owe that money to anybody anymore. So it's not relevant to show it as a liability. How do we account for derecognition? The words in the framework are, we're going to faithfully represent the changes in the entity's net assets, as well as any assets or liabilities retained. So they give you three parts to this. They say you de-recognize any transferred, expired or consumed component. You recognize a gain or a loss on the above and you recognize any retained component. Now, there are many examples of this. I've taken a fairly simple one, which is selling an asset. So when you sell an asset, what do you do? you de-recognize any transferred, expired or consumed component. Basically, you take the asset out of your statement of financial position. You credit the asset. Down to the bottom bullet here, you recognize any retained component. Well, if you've got some cash for selling your asset, then you're going to debit cash. You're going to recognize those cash proceeds. And the difference between the two is this middle bullet here, which is recognizing any gain or loss on the above. The difference between those two numbers is your profit on disposal, which goes in the statement of profit or loss. And that's an example of how you account for the de-recognition of an asset when you sell it. That was de-recognition. So we've talked about putting something in recognition, taking something out, de-recognition. What about measurement then? So what number should I attribute to the assets and liabilities and income and expenses in the financial statements? Um, on the measurement side, the framework has simplified a little bit actually from the old rules. It kind of says there are two basic ways of measuring things in the financial statements. There's historical cost, which is broadly what we originally spent on the asset, what the original amount of the liability was. Um, for an asset, that includes the original cost, less depreciation, that would be historical cost. Or there's a current value. So you might value your asset at its current cost, what it would cost now to replace it. You might value it at its fair value, so the market value effectively. You might value it at its value in use, so maybe the present value of the future cash flows that it's going to earn you. These are all current values at the end of the year, and broadly speaking, those are the two ways that we measure assets. How do I decide which one to do when you're trying to choose what sort of measurement basis you should apply? It's all about the relevance. So you need to maximise the relevance to the users of financial statements. And you need to think, OK, what is this asset or liability going to be used for? What are the characteristics of the asset or liability? And also you need to think, how's that asset or liability contributing to my future cash flows. For example, you could have a building, but it might be used for very different purposes and that would change the way you account for it. So on the left hand side here, I said, well, what if you bought a building to use in your business? I buy a factory. I'm not intending to sell it. I'm going to use this factory for years and years and years in my business. Seems to me the most appropriate way of presenting that on the financial statements is the cost of the factory minus the annual depreciation. The market value is irrelevant because we're not selling the factory. Alternatively, what if you bought yourself a building, 
intending to sell it and make a profit. So the reason I've invested in this building here is not to use it in my business, but to keep hold of it and then sell it and make money. That's an investment property. And it would be more appropriate to account for a property like that at its fair value to show the gains as the market value changes, because that's why we bought it in order to make use of those changes in market value. So it's just two different ways you might account for a building depending on why you bought it and what you're intending to use it for. That was measurement. The final part of the framework, as far as we're concerned, is presentation and disclosure. And this is all about deciding between whether an item of income or expense goes in profit or loss and whether it goes in other comprehensive income. The framework says the statement of profit or loss is the primary source of information about an entity's financial performance. So we can get from that if you've got income, if you've got expenses, if you're not sure where they should go, your default is the statement of profit or loss. So what about other comprehensive income? Framework says an item of income or expense may be required to be presented in OCI, other comprehensive income, if it results from measuring an item to its current value, and if it means profit or loss is more relevant by basically excluding that income or expenditure and a more faithful representation is provided of the entity's resources. So this is about keeping profit or loss relevant. And sometimes you have income and expenses and it's actually better to leave them out of profit or loss. And the only types of income and expenses we leave out per the framework is ones that result from remeasuring an item to its year end value, to its current value. Examples, you all know about revaluation gains and that's a classic example of this. So that, um, that building that I bought, if I wasn't holding it as an investment property, if I was using it in my business, but actually I decided, well, actually I do want to restate it to fair value at the end of the year, that would be the revaluation model under IS 16. What do we do when we take an item of property, plant and equipment and we restate it to its year end value, we revalue it, those revaluation gains don't go in the statement of profit or loss, they go in other comprehensive income. The reason is we're re-measuring the item to its current value, it's a revaluation. Is it relevant to exclude it from profit or loss? Well, yes, because if something is property, plant and equipment, by its very definition, you are using it in your business. So that is its primary function, is being used as a head office, as a factory, as a shop, as your accounting hub, whatever it is, yeah, your call centre. So it's not entirely relevant if the market value fluctuates while you have it. Yeah, we exclude that from the statement of profit or loss. Another example that some of you won't have come across, but some of you will, if we have a subsidiary that's overseas that keeps its accounts in a different currency, then we'll get foreign exchange gains and losses on that subsidiary as the foreign currency rates move over time. Those foreign exchange gains, are they totally relevant? Well, no, actually, if we're not going to sell our overseas subsidiary, then it's not relevant to show that volatility, that change in foreign currency as a gain or loss in the statement of profit or loss. It muddies the waters, it introduces volatility. So what we do with an overseas subsidiary where you've got foreign exchange gains and losses is we put them in other comprehensive income. So we do recognise them in the group accounts, but we don't recognise them in profit or loss. So I've put some of my income and expenses in other comprehensive income. Should I at any point move it into the statement of profit or loss? So where I did credit other comprehensive income with a gain, is there ever a point at which I should debit other comprehensive income to reverse that entry and credit the statement of profit or loss? Framework says you should reclassify income and expenditure that's been included in other comprehensive income to profit or loss when doing so results in profit or loss providing more relevant information. Now we don't for PPE as you know so once you've revalued PPE through OCI those revaluation gains never get reclassified to profit or loss. We would 
for that overseas subsidiary. So when you invested in overseas subsidiary and you accumulated all those foreign exchange gains and losses through OCI over time, when you sell the overseas sub, you take those accumulated foreign exchange gains and losses, you reverse them through OCI and you put them in the statement of profit or loss. You show that the group has now crystallized that foreign exchange net gain or loss. And that is the seven parts of the framework. Like I say, if you ever find yourself with a book and pick up the framework and read it, you will find an eighth part, which is called capital maintenance, but it doesn't form a large part of any of the accountancy syllabuses. So we're not covering it in this tutorial. I would suggest on the back of this tutorial that if you are doing your ACCA or SEMA exams, and that's why you've picked up this online tutorial here, you go back to your book, back to your study text, back to your workbooks and have another look at it and maybe think to yourself, can I find in my syllabus an example that fits in with each of these seven parts of the framework here? This has been a tutorial for the conceptual framework for financial reporting uh, for Kaplan. Watch out for more little tutorials from Kaplan in the future and thank you for watching. Bye bye.